And thank you everyone for, for being here. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all about some of the stuff that um, I've been doing. Um, ah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that's okay. If, yeah, if people can't hear me online, just, just let me know, I guess, and we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, so uh, really excited to be here talking to you about some of the stuff that we've been doing with native uh, heresia mushrooms um, at University of Queensland as part of my work uh, in collaboration with a few different, few different people. Um, I'd like to start with just a, an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, the Turrbal and Yagara people. Um, I'd like to pay uh, my respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue their cultural and spiritual connection to country. And I would especially like to pay my respects to uh, Indigenous Australians as the first scientists of Australia. Um, a lot of this, this work and the sorts of things that I'm, I'm looking at are stuff that uh, most likely was known a long time ago by, by, by people. And unfortunately, a lot of that knowledge no longer uh, exists or, or we just never bothered to ask. And so, um, <clears throat> yes, I'd just like to, to recognize that I'm certainly not the first person to have uh, walked this path. Um, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to, in the future, at least engage with, with some of these communities to um, have a look at and see if there's ways that we can collaborate and, and build towards something where their knowledge and science um, can be uh, respected and included in some of the work that we do. Um, so I thought I'd give a just a quick background on who I am and what I do and where I come from. So I'm Kylie. I have been at University of Queensland for a really long time. I don't have a laser pointer with me, but that that really ugly looking gray thing down the bottom there is the building that I've lived in for the last however many years. And there's a chuckle in the back from someone who also has lived in that building for the last several years with me in that building, which is currently, uh, it, it rains inside sometimes. <laughs> it's a great place. Um, it is a good place to work. We have a lot of really great facilities and this is the group that I work with. So I'm, I work under the supervision of um, Professor Alva Robertson, who's this person in the pinkish shirt there in the middle. Um, but my journey at, at UQ actually began quite a, a, a wee while ago. So I, I started at UQ in 2008 when I did my Bachelor of Science um, with a major in chemistry. Um, I've then went away and I worked for a little bit at QUT in doing some, doing some genetics uh, things for whatever reason I decided chemistry wasn't wasn't it for me for a, for a few years at least and then I came back and decided maybe it was it and I did a PhD in medicinal chemistry and now here I am so I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher so I'm an early career researcher within Avril's group um, and my interest in fungi actually goes back all the way to the beginning of this process back in 2008 when I was an undergrad and a very, um, I would say, overly ambitious um, and inquisitive student and probably annoyed a lot of my lecturers with my incessant questions and knocking on their doors. And one of the people whose doors I knocked on was um, this person, James Fraser, whose picture is not up here, but he is a, a fungal gen geneticist who works at UQ. He does a lot of stuff with Cryptococcus and um, a lot of smut um, fungi. He does, um, a lot of things with uh, pathogenic fungus and, and various other things. And as a, I think within probably the first month of my time at UQ, I decided that I wanted to try and do something with him in his lab. And I don't know what he was thinking about letting a first year into his lab, but he did. And that small, tiny little project that went for maybe a couple of months over the summer is what actually got me my job five years later at QUT. And having that relationship then helped me in, uh, working in my PhD. I've actually done a lot of work in my PhD. And now since as a postdoc, I've continued to do work in his lab and he kind of gives me free reign. And so now I spend a lot of my time taking over his incubators and growing mushrooms. Um, and this picture hasn't shown up very well on these slides, but uh, I actually, I work across both ends of the size spectrum when it comes to fungi. So most of my work in my PhD work was involving um, microfungi, so mostly candida and designing new drugs for targeting um, invasive infectious species, uh, candida auris and albicans and things that you, you get usually when you're in hospital and very sick. And they are a very underappreciated uh, invasive disease, um, almost as, as bad as a lot of the antibacterials, um, the bacterial infections that you might, you might also see in a hospital, but uh, as with all fungi apparently, are very underappreciated and under-researched. So I've spent a lot of time doing drug design in that space. And then very recently in the last year have moved towards mushrooms. And it's not somewhere I think I ever thought that I would be researching or doing anything in. Um, it's not something I had a particular interest in at all until about a year or so ago. Um, but one Sunday I decided 
um, I was very bored and I watched a documentary and it's a fine documentary, I guess, but as I was going through it and the, the wheel started uh, ticking and I was watching these things and, and uh, learning a bit about the types of cool molecules and whatever that these mushrooms have in them and the types of biological activities that they have, I started thinking, well, what sort of things do we have in Australia? Did, has anyone really done much work on them? Thinking, well, as with every idea that I've tried to come up with in finding my independence as a researcher, someone's already done it. It's already taken up by about a million different people. And as everyone in this room would know, no one is looking at fungi really. Like there are very few people in, in Australia who are looking at, at native fungi. And that was really surprising to me. And then I remembered, I actually know people who grow mushrooms. So this is Mickey and Amy, they own and run uh, Little Acre. And so they, uh, you might've heard of them. They've, they've been in operation, I think since about 2016. And so they grow and sell a lot of gourmet mushrooms, um, oyster mushrooms, that sort of thing. And they also grow uh, hericiums, lion's mane, lion mane. And <clears throat> after I'd watched this documentary, I, I and had sort of established that there wasn't a lot being done on native species. I thought I might contact them and just see if they were interested in doing anything or if they had anything that they were interested in looking at. And it turned out that um, they were. And so they, they started their business in essentially in their backyard, just growing mushrooms in little tubs. There are a point now where they have um, quite a lot of lab space and uh, warehousing space where they grow their mushrooms. And they also, they have a really big, uh, really keen interest in researching some of the species that we have not necessarily from a commercial standpoint, they have a lot of things there that they have no intention of selling. They're just interested in knowing um, what's around. And so they were very interested in collaborating and we, we happened to, to start looking at some of the native mushrooms that they were growing. And I'll get into a little bit about the heresiums and the things that we've been looking at in the last year. But, and, and this, this slide sort of comes from other presentations. I don't need to tell a lot of uh, anyone here really about Australian native mushrooms and all the cool things that they can do and, and how we don't really know anything about them. But for those of you uh, online maybe or in the room who don't know quite, a, uh, don't know as much, Australia has a huge diversity of, of fungal species and, and in particular mushrooms. And I've included just a couple of pictures of some of the, the ones that I quite like um, up here. So there's a beach orange there on the, on the far side, which is uh, one that you find in Tasmania. It's a really sweet tasting one and there's obviously the ghost mushroom and then there's this other cool blue one which I think comes in several different colors and is only found in like one place. <laughs> and we have, there are lots of different estimates about how many species we have, um, but we don't really know a lot about what we have and so that's why we have this huge gap in this number of 50,000 to 250,000 species potentially of, of fungi. A lot of them are thought to be endemic very few of them have been described. And the fact that we don't have any of this information about them means that we don't really know, for example, if something is introduced, which is obviously bad if you're thinking about uh, conservation and being able to, and managing like nat um, national park systems and that sort of thing. We don't know a lot about whether some species are toxic or if they're edible or what other sorts of useful things they might have in them. And I, I just pulled this snapshot actually from the same reference that I got some of these numbers here from something I thought was quite interesting. And this is from 2009, but something I thought was quite interesting from this table was in the number of uh, threatened or endangered species. If you look at that, it says three, I think we're up to 600 and something now, but you compare the number of estimated species of fungi in the world compared to plants, that number seems like pretty small which is very telling of the fact that we just don't know a lot about the, what, what we've got out there and how important they are. And so I mentioned indigenous knowledge before. And so compared to plants, there's very little knowledge that exists currently, um, recorded knowledge at least, that concerns the use of uh, mushrooms or fungi in Aboriginal communities. There are some uh, early uh, reports about ones that have been used for food and as medicines. So uh, the one I mentioned before, which is the uh, beach orange, um, Cetaria gunnii. Um, we also have things like desert truffles. There's uh, I think about seven different species of those that we have, that we know of. Native bread, of course, which is one that a lot of people know of. And this one, I think um, from, from memory, from what I was reading of it, uh, Aboriginal people were really good at finding these just by smell and knowing exactly where to dig. And things like orange shelf uh, fungus, which has some uh, medicinal properties. I think it was used for treating ulcers and that sort of thing. And there's obviously probably a lot more that we just don't know about. <clears throat> so 
why would we care? And again, sort of preaching to the choir here, I guess. So we, we all know why we would want to care about mushrooms. But um, we know that in other parts of the world and, and probably here as well, fungi have been used for millennia as food, as medicine. Um, we use it to make food. We use it for drinks. We use it recreationally for cultural things. More recently, we've had other um, pretty cool applications, things to do with fire control of pests or by remediation of soil, because there are, there are some fungi, for example, that are really good at eating wood. Um, those are good for uh, like remediation of waste products. We can use them to make biofuels, to make medicines, things like enhancing um, crops, making cosmetics, all sorts of things. Okay. And so Herisium, so this is this is what we started working on with, with Mickey. So Mickey had, um, when I was talking to him, he had a native coral tooth. So Herisiums are a, a, a white rot fungus. They occur um, pretty much everywhere. Uh, in Australia, we, we only have, uh, um, at least as far as I'm aware, uh, the coral tooth, the Herisium coralloides. The one that most people will have heard of will be lion's mane, which is Herisium erinaceus up there. That one occurs in Americas and also in Asia. It's been used in China pretty um, as a, a, a medicinal food, essentially. Um, used in a lot of Chinese traditional medicines, and you'll also find it online as like a dietary supplement, as a powder, treating all sorts of things depending on who you <clears throat> on who you trust. Um, they're really great at degrading and decomposing wood. Um, I, some of them are found on live trees, but for the most part, they're just found on dead stumps. The one that I have a picture of there is actually a picture I took from uh, Dagula. The, that one lives up in um, Myala. If you go through there around like May to June, there's two stumps. If you walk around that track, where you'll find two different ones. They look quite different. Um, they are supposedly coral tooths, but again, who knows? <laughs> um, and so going back to the conservation uh, the conservation bit that I mentioned before, something I did find interesting. I think there's, I, I can't remember exactly how many, a small number um, of fungi in Australia that are currently on the uh, red list, which is a conservation uh, target list. Um, and Herisium does appear on there, but what I thought was quite interesting is that the one that appears on there for Australia is Herisium erinaceus, which is not one that happens in Australia, occurs in Australia at all. Um, and if you look at the red list map distribution map, that's supposedly where it occurs, which is again, is not, it doesn't occur in Australia. So I'm not sure where this information came from, but um, it is on the red list, possibly some crosswise in that. Um, oh, that picture is not meant to be there. There's meant to be a bit of text behind that that was supposed to come up before this did um, in any case. One of the, the really great things about herisiums and why they're so interesting and have been used in traditional medicines a lot is because of all of their, um, the really cool compounds that they make and the uh, uh, health benefits that have been found to be associated with those. And so uh, these chemicals, we, we call them secondary metabolites. So these are things that the, um, the fungal cells make for whatever reason. It can be for um, environmental stress response or for other uh, molecular defense, that sort of thing. They've been found to have um, anti-cancer properties, anti-inflammation, um, antibacterial. Uh, but the really exciting thing that these guys that these do is related to what they can do in the brain. And so <clears throat> I'll go through. There we go. Um, so I think just last week, uh, it's fine. It's something that I'll ha I'd have to uh, change in the slide. Um, Last week, there was a group at University of Queensland who'd, who were doing some work with um, a Korean company, and they'd published this paper well, in January um, about how uh, some of these, the compounds in the, the lion's mane improve memory. Um, and so, and that's one of the many things that, that, that they are able to do. They're also known for, uh, as example, in, in this paper, they have been found to be uh, useful in protecting against um, ischemia uh, injuries. So it's related to the blood flow. Um, that one there said something about, uh, I believe, uh, Alzheimer's as well. They've been implicated as a treatment for Alzheimer's. There's also uh, mem memory and depression or anxiety treatment. Um, and yeah, again, uh, memory and then um, yeah, the brain injury. So they have some really exciting properties. And, and what you would have noticed if you could have seen them is that the titles and all of those papers relate very specifically to lion's mane. And that's because um, the other herisiums, which are uh, pretty abundant, uh, things like the coral tooths, like the coralloides that, we, that we're looking at, um, haven't really been looked at to the same extent, but they, they do have a lot of uh, very similar compounds in them. 
Um, and so we were interested in looking at some of the, the native ones that we have and figuring out, well, can they do similar things? Can they do them better? Can they do other things? And what sort of, what sort of things are, are they making? Can we, can we get something useful out of that? And so fungi are really good at making really complex, strange looking um, chemicals. Uh, we have a lot of medicines that you will have heard of that come from fungi. The example I've put up there are echinocandins, which are weird because they come from a fungi, but they're also used as an antifungal. Um, <clears throat> so those come from aspergillus, which is mold, uh, and they're semi-synthetic, but you can also get the just the naturally occurring ones. They're really good, really effective at killing um, all sorts of other pathogenic fungi that you would find in invasive infections. Um, <clears throat> and so we also have see things like uh, lava statin and uh, you'll see uh, things like pigments and that sort of thing. They, and they, the types of compounds that they make have these really complex architectures. You don't need to worry about uh, looking at this and thinking that it looks like complete gibberish. It is, but <clears throat> you can get the general idea that some of the structures in this are quite big, they're complex. There's a lot of things going on in there and they're very good at making these things. <clears throat> and in, the coral, the coral tooths and in the other types of heresia mushrooms, we can see uh, some very, they have some very specific metabolites that are responsible for all of those um, really cool things that they can do in the brain, things like the heresiarin, which was um, the subject of one of the papers um, that was in this, uh, in one of the, one of the little papers that I, I posted up there. I think that one is implicated in uh, improving uh, memory and spatial memory. Um, the one down the bottom there is, is uh, implicated as a treatment for Alzheimer's. It's good at uh, regenerating uh, neurons and in, in, um, rat models and mice models. And, and some of these things have been looked at, um, uh, progressed as far as clinical trials, I believe as, I believe as well. But again, we don't really know like what, what we have in the native species here. So we thought it would be really useful to, to start looking at that. And so the question then, and what I wanted to, to give an overview of today as part of this talk was how, how do we actually find these things? What methods do we use to, to look for them and figure out if they're actually useful? And so from the chemist's perspective, uh, what, we, what we might do is we'll get our mushrooms, we'll dry those mushrooms, then we'll mill them down to a powder. We'll put those into a chemical solvent, which will take out um, all of the different metabolites that are in those mushroom cells. We might use different types of solvents to get different types of chemicals, and then we'll purify those out. So our first extracts will have hundreds or thousands of chemicals in them. So you might have some idea of what's in there, maybe if you're, if you're looking at it with different types of characterization, but it's essentially a forest and it's, it's not always easy to, to figure out what you've got in there. But you can purify those down a little bit. So you start getting uh, pools of um, uh, pools of more pure and pure fractions that you can start looking at and you can purify them again and again and eventually you might have something where you've got a, a little flask that has maybe one thing in it and you have to go through the process of identifying it using the different um, techniques that we have available and pinning all of those clues together to figure out what kind of structure you have. If you're lucky you'll have a machine that can at least do some of that for you. Um, and you'll have a compound maybe that is known before. And so uh, bad luck in terms of um, getting a fun publication or something that's never been found before, um, but good in terms of it's a bit easier to identify. And if you're thinking that this process sounds tedious, it is, it's very long, it's very expensive, and it also misses a lot of information because you're being very selective about what you're looking for. And oftentimes what you'll find are things that are there in quite high abundance. <clears throat> That's not always, those aren't always the things that have the really interesting types of activities that we, we want to maybe um, try and fish out. Another way that you might choose to do it, and this has the same problem, of course, with of missing a lot of information. And this actually comes from uh, work that I did in a previous um, appointment where I was looking at um, plant oils, so manuka oils, is you can take the plant and you can take extracts of it in the same way that I showed in the previous bit. And then maybe uh, if we want to just look for things that actually are active or maybe can, can do things that we want it to do, we'll take that and we'll go and do some kind of test on it to see if it's active in some way. And in this case, it was testing it against scabies. So we had little scabies mites. We took this plant oil, we threw, the, threw it at the mites. And if they died, cool. We could then take that, purify it a little bit more, do it again, 
and you're, you're essentially just whittling down the number of things that you're looking at until eventually you'll have um, just one thing that you're looking at, which is giving you this activity. You can also combine that with like statistical data. So if we, we have an idea maybe of what's in there, we can, we can correlate the abundance of that with the activity that you're getting. But again, it's long, it's tedious, it's expensive, and it really relies on having a lot of good information, which for plants you, you often will have, but um, for fungi, you frequently don't. So how else can we do this? And now this is a very complicated looking slide. <clears throat> and this is the sort, um, sort of approach that we, we went with with our Harissia mushrooms. So I'll step, step you through it, but don't worry too much about understanding what's going on here. But essentially we're, we're taking some of that, um, some of those concepts where we're looking at the activity of the things that are inside it. We're pulling those out with different chemicals. We're looking at what kinds of things that they can do. And we've picked different types of tests based on what we already know about other types of mushrooms. Um, but at the same time, we're looking at everything else that's inside that cell. So we're taking not just the chemical, but we're also taking all of the other big bits of machinery, the, the genes that are in there, the proteins that are in there. And we're looking at those together to see if we can figure out, um, is there uh, something else in there that maybe we're missing? Is there, um, can we, tie this, this, uh, this, all this data together to try and help us, uh, help direct us to where there might be something interesting to look at. And the concept behind this, so this is, um, I guess we're, we're now looking rather than just at one part of what is inside the cell, we're now taking um, a bit more of a big picture approach. So we're looking a bit further out. And so it is important then to, to know, well, how, how does a cell, how does a fungus make all of these weird looking things? And so it starts, of course, with your DNA, which is in every living cell. And we might think about that, uh, think of that as like, uh, I guess, like a cookbook or um, there's all sorts of analogies that you'll see about, about this, but a cookbook is a, is a good one. It will have lots of different recipes that you can use. Your uh, fungus will want to make um, different types of things. And so it will take some of those recipes and copy them into these things that we would call transcripts, your mRNA, and then something else will come along and it will read that and it will make these proteins, which are the workhorses of the cells. These are the things that will make, go on then to make the, all of these complicated um, molecules that we see and that we want to look at. So in, <laughs> in essence, our genomics is telling us what is possible. So it's our, it's our cookbook. Our, our transcriptomics and proteomics. So these are, um, when we're looking at these big data sets are telling us, well, th this is what sort of machinery the cell is making. And then we can tie that in with our um, looking at the composition. So looking at all of the chemicals that are in there, all of the compounds. And that's essentially telling us this is what this machinery is doing. So we're getting a full view of what it can do, what it is doing, and um, like what sort of machinery is making to do the things that we're, we're really interested in looking at. And why this is important is because it means that we, when we can integrate these things together, we can get a really good, really big insight into uh, how a cell is regulating, um, it, why, why it's making these things. It can tell us things about evolution, how these pathways are evolving, how different um, species are related to each other as well. Um, and it can tell us a lot about how, uh, how these pathways and, um, are responding to the environment and the things that are around it, because these things aren't static. They have lots of really um, complicated feedback mechanisms. So uh, if, if your, your mushroom is starting to sense danger, maybe there's some other bacteria or something there that it, maybe it doesn't want, or maybe it's something like a mycorrhizal association where it's, they're trying to work together towards something. They, they have very intricate uh, signaling pathways that it can use to detect what's going on around it. And that feedback is telling it then, well, this is what I need to make to do these things. And this is the molecule that I need to, to make more of to do this, or I need to make less of that. And so having this gives us that, that kind of bird's eye view. And so in, in terms of mushrooms, what we can then use that for from an application sense is uh, we can look for patterns in these and we can associate them with um, ones that are making toxins or if they're making a particular molecule that we're, we're looking at. Or if we're thinking from a food perspective, we might be really interested in say vitamins or other types of minerals that we want to make more of for like a fortified food. 
um, we can we can also use it to look for things that are in really low abundance. So one of the one of the downfalls, of course, with the the very like mechanical um, manual way of sifting through this stuff, um, is that if things are in really low abundance, they can be really hard to find. But that doesn't mean they're not important. Having all of this information can help us pinpoint that. And it's not easy. I say this like it's just a walk in the park. It's not. Um, these data sets are huge, and it can be difficult to manage them and, and um, actually filter through them. Knowing how these things respond, if we're thinking again from a food perspective um, to their environment, is really good if we're if we're wanting to cultivate them as well. So we can see how the how these things will change in response to different growing conditions. Um, <clears throat> But as I said, it's a lot. There's a lot to work with, and it's it's easier as we go on. But we're still we've gone to a point where we can um, make a lot of data, but actually processing it and analyzing it is is quite difficult. We're talking like the computing power that you need for this stuff is intense, um, and they're very selective about uh, who can have access to this sort of um, this sort of stuff because the amount of uh, work and time it takes to have this all up and running and, and working is is quite a lot, and it's expensive. Um, actually getting the data has become a lot cheaper. So if you're thinking about genome sequencing, like 10 years ago, human genome would have been in the order of about $10,000, whereas these days it's about a, a thousand or less for the fungal genomics uh, stuff. So um, last year I did, I think about 16 fungal, complete fungal genomes, and that cost about $6,000. Um, so one is about 200 and, $250, which is much cheaper than it used to be. And the time frame from giving them the sample to you getting the sequence back is about six weeks, which is way shorter than it used to be. And yeah, so collecting data, very, like relatively not, not too complicated. Analyzing it, very hard to do. And so where does that leave us with the native coral, um, coral tooth mushrooms that we have? Um, so at the moment, and th this is actually the, the last slide because we there's a lot of stuff that we are doing, but it's it's we're in the process now of being able to validate this stuff. With with fungi, it's one of the really difficult things compared to plants is that plants have a lot of really good, nice databases that you can lean on when you're getting when you're going through all of these huge data sets, and it can help you um, filter out results that are misleading or or incorrect. With fungi, those data sets aren't quite as evolved. Um, and so there's a bit of work in actually um, designing these, these pipelines so that we can uh, make sure that we're, we're seeing real things and not just random artifacts or things that aren't possible. And so we're in the process of doing that at the moment. So we have sequences um, of, uh, I think, a few native species from Victoria and New South Wales, and then also um, some other heresiums from around the place. And what we're hoping we'll be able to do is to compare all of that information to see how they're related to each other um, and see what sort of diversity um, we, we have with at least the species that we have. Um, and I also have uh, permits now to, to collect things from around here. So hoping that uh, this year we'll be able to collect some of the native species that we have here so we can get a, a broader picture or at least of the, um, the genomic diversity, but also the chemical diversity that we have. Um, and hopefully we'll, we're, we're doing some biological screening at the moment as well. And the native species that we have um, does have like some pretty significant differences, at least from the, some of the testing that we've, we've done. So um, interestingly, uh, the native one compared to into some of the international varieties have some pretty uh, good antifungal activity, for example, against some like uh, pathogenic yeast. And so tying that into what they're making is, is sort of where we're at at the moment. And so with that, I won't take up any more of your time. So I'd just like to thank everyone here for, for listening um, and also for all of the people listed here for helping me with the work and, and uh, collaborating. So um, particularly to Mickey and Amy and, and uh, Isabeau uh, Lauer, so, uh, whose name is spelled incorrectly up there, but she was my research assistant last year who did a lot of the um, the work in the chem the wet lab work in the chemistry lab and then um, yeah everyone else here for funding and support and all of you so questions yeah okay. does anyone have any questions for Kylie yeah so the question was about uh do the so the heresiums that are sold in uh powdered form does that impact um the biologically active 
uh, molecules and those, the profiles of those compared to fresh, so it was fresh batter. Um, it's difficult because the way that we look at it is by drying it as well, but different methods of drying it will have different impacts um, on uh, lots of different things. So you have a lot of antioxidants in these as well, and those are very susceptible to photo degradation. So if it's just out there in the light, then those are, those are just going to disappear. Um, the things that are responsible for the activities in the brain, I'm not actually sure if those I think there are some changes in a few of them, depending on how you dry them. So if you're using like sun drying, for example, that's usually not great. Um, the other thing with these, and it's very same, they're very similar for plants and, and other uh, extracts, any, any of those things, the regulation on those is, is very lax compared to other things. And so um, it, they'll often not have <laughs> the active ingredients in them that they, they supposedly have. And with mushrooms in, um, in particular, there is a, a, a pretty sizable difference in what you get in the fruiting bodies versus what you might get if you were doing a fermentation, for example. So some of those active compounds you'll only find in, in fermentations, you won't find them in the fruiting bodies. Um, so yeah, I guess to answer your question, yeah, there is a pretty big difference and it depends where you get it from because you also then might run into the troubles of um, like heavy metals as well as another big thing because they're very good at absorbing, um, taking those up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think I understand. Yeah. So the que the question was about, um, yeah, I guess like delivery of those compounds in combination with uh, niacin and, and, and other, what was the other thing? Psilocybin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So the promotion of those as a, as a, um, yeah, uh, taking them combines the psilocybin that sort of thing um i'm not i'm not sure there might be some uh interactions i suppose one one thing that uh hasn't really been looked in at least from what i understand in the, in, the, in the literature is when you eat these things um like we we can do these assays in in mice or or in cells but when we're doing that we're, we're taking these things and we're putting them right in the blood but there are so many things in between your mouth and your blood um, that would stop that from happening. So um, it's not it's not super clear. I, I think they've done studies with like fresh, um, just like the hericea mushrooms, fresh mushrooms, and that's where they see a lot of those antidepressive and anti-anxiety things. Um, whether having that with things like niacin or whatever else would improve the uptake of those potentially, it it would I mean wouldn't be unheard of I suppose, but um, you would have to do quite a lot of testing to know if that was the case. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So any clues on where and when you might find the native heresiums while it's the wet and raining decaying wood only or particular trees? Not just decaying wood. I think they do grow on live ones. But as with most mushrooms, cold, damp, they love rainforests. So you'll find them in, I'm not sure where Penelope is from, but if you're in Queensland, they're in Dagwilla. You'll see some in um, up in Mullaney, in Mary Cancross, I think there's one. Lamington, Springbrook, usually around the, your typical seasons, May through July, sometimes October. Yeah. Yeah, they're very, the great thing about them is they're super easy to identify. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to mistake them for anything else. Yeah, so have I had a chance to compare the uh, cultivated ones with the wild ones? No, I'm going to be this year though. <laughs> yes, with the very grateful help of, of Nigel in the back and, and others as well. So um, yeah, hopeful. I, the, all of the genomic stuff I, I have funded through um, uh, BioPlatforms Australia, which is a federal, uh, federally funded resource. They have no facilities that do, do um, all of the genomics, proteomics, all of that stuff. And they have, I think actually only, they've only just announced it, but they were in talks of it last year, announced a, a funding program focused on Australian native fungi. So if you do research in the area, I would encourage you to look that up because the process of applying is not competitive. They just want you to align with what they're after, which is they're looking for research into native fungi that has um, uh, for, not just for research sake, essentially. So if you're looking for useful things, things that are like maybe you're making um, new drugs or something like that. Um, but they have they have a bit of money to to go around. So if you're. If you're in the area, I would encourage you to look it up and apply. Yes. So am I doing anything with the substrate that it's growing on was the question. The answer is uh, yes, um, both in the sense of cultivation. So what I would really like to be able to do is, uh, so from the food perspective, um, I mean, my interest really is like just the, the research side and the drug discovery side. That's what I really enjoy. But the food stuff is also quite fun. So 
I am from that perspective looking at um, different agricultural waste things. So uh, unlike the um, agaricus, the ones you get in the supermarkets, those things which will grow on compost, a lot of these will grow on agricultural waste, like sawdust, that sort of thing, um, which is great because we make a lot of it. So uh, trying to look at how some of those species um, respond to um, those or sugar cane, I guess, or the other really cool one is um, uh, insect carcasses. So we have um, a lot of places in Australia that will sell predatory insects and they generate a lot of insect carcass waste. Um, and using that also, um, at least from uh, in other species. So I'm not just looking at Herisians, I also am looking at um, like cordyceps and a few other things, uh, extracts of those to see how they respond to growth. And in terms of the natural growing habitats, what I would like to be able to do is also um, look at what they grow alongside with. So the, the microbe environment um, as well. And yes, looking at what sort of woods they're growing on. Because I think something we have found, normally they're associated with hardwoods. Um, but I think uh, one of the heresiums that Mickey has, one of the native ones, I believe he found um, only grows on softwood um, chips. So looking at that would also be interesting. Yeah. And the way that we get these things out and look at their metabolomes is by sitting them in alcohol or in chloroform or in water. But the, those ones, the ones that have the effect on memory and depressive um, disorder and that sort of thing, those we find in um, usually ethanol or chloroform. So it would, it would most likely be sitting in that if it's just, yeah. Yes, yeah, so gene sequencing might identify interesting medicinally beneficial compounds, but there is another mountain to climb in growing fungi or mycelia to get them to actually manufacture these compounds. Yes, definitely. And so that's, that's one of the benefits of getting not just the gene sequences, but also looking at the proteins that they're making and how much they're making and also the metabolomes um, and uh, how how much of these chemicals they're making. Because if you, you can tie that together with, um, uh, so looking at the quantities, not just what they're making, then you can figure out what pathways are leading to those and how that's responding to the environment. So you can then change, you can alter the conditions to optimize that production um, essentially. And so you might do that for all sorts of things. They do it in uh, yeast a lot and um, a lot of microfungi that they use to make um, like biofuels or, or drugs or whatever else have you um, as well. <clears throat> yeah, so am I aware of anything that's happening in the area of uh, native trichodermas? No, I'm not. Um, I've certainly done a, a good job of sequencing a few by accident. Um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, not, not that I'm aware of, but I spend yeah, most of my time looking up um, uh, some of the other other species, so it's possible that I've just missed it when I'm doing such as. Yeah, so sorry, the, the response for those who are online was that there are um, companies in Australia who are producing different trichodermas for um, the fungal um, control of um, fungal disease. Um, and I, I was aware of that application. I wasn't aware which, which species was doing it. They're used for all sorts of cool things now. Uh, how long do your heresians that grow, that you grow live for? <laughs> Um, on uh, well, on a on an agar plate, uh, a really long time, um, much longer than I thought actually. When I um, had some samples of these that I had subcultured out onto an agar plate so that I could work with them and make fermentations of them, um, I had them um, just sitting in the lab drawer where our aircon is really cold. Um, so just sitting in there, and they started to just grow the little mycelia out into the out into the agar and then I realized one of them had become um, a little contaminated so I put it in the fridge and then forgot about it because I do a million things. Uh, three months later I came back and it had grown fruiting bodies on the on the agar <laughs> um, and they're still going so <laughs> while while I guess um, yeah they're they're pretty yeah pretty prolific they love just sitting in the fridge and growing fruit 